Father, we just want to thank you that we can rejoice in your presence, Lord. And as we just started the meeting today, we, we, we just sang about your presence. Lord, that's all we want. Father, if it's not your presence, then we just don't want to go anywhere. We don't want to do anything, Lord, without your presence. Because, Father, it's just, it's just a lot of work without you. And so, Father, I pray that you'll just breathe life into this place today. Breathe life into us. Lord, let your word live. Lord, let your word just bring forth that which you desire today. Lord, we, we know that, Lord, heaven didn't wake up this morning. But, Lord, you've, you, heaven is vigilant, waiting on your people to catch hold of that for which you took hold of us for. And so, Lord, I pray, move amongst us today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Over the last uh, two weeks, we've been looking at, um, you know, why, why is it that we, we get to a stage in our walk with God and we, we end up depressed and we end up sort of heavy and burdened and, and um, we've lost our joy in, in serving the Lord. And, um, you know, we start off with this excit- excitement, this, we found Jesus and there's nothing better in life. It's like... Um, We've we've just it's like we've just died and gone to heaven kind of thing. It's like we've 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 experienced the most amazing love, and then we we go on our walk with the Lord, and things just become heavier and heavier, and we wonder where did our joy go, and um, and it's because of false conceptions that we've taken on things that we've uh, that we've believed as we've walked our Christian life. Stuff that has been heaped on us, religious rubbish, really, that has been heaped onto our lives, that has been ingrained on the inside of us, that we live under this yoke um, of trying to attain to something that is actually not the gospel. It is actually not what Jesus died for. It is not our inheritance, but we carry it with us, and we wonder why we've lost our joy. And we wonder why it is that we stand as ambassadors before Jesus, and we say, He's wonderful, He's wonderful, and you walk away and you think about my life is miserable. But we are such great ambassadors, but inside we're suffering. Why? And a lot of the stuff is that we have to unlearn some of the religious, religious stuff, rubbish, in our life that we've believed and, um, and heaped upon us that we carry through life. And, um, and we've got to get back to the pure gospel what is the gospel? What is, what is it that Jesus really died for? What is it that he came to set us free from that we are now heat back onto our lives? Um, and it's just to get back to that. Last week we looked at Jesus as our high priest. Um, and the reason why we cannot mix the law with Jesus, because Jesus was not of the lineage of Levi, therefore he disqualified as a high priest. He could never be a high priest um, in in, in that order, because he was from the tribe of Judah, okay? And only those from the Levitical line could become a priest. And so Jesus disqualifies as high priest. But it says in Hebrews 7 verse 12, that if, if there is a new priesthood, then there is a new law. Okay, so the old law has to pass away when a new priesthood comes into existence. Therefore, Jesus and the Levitical law cannot mix. All right? There's a new law that he brings in. Everything is new. It's a new way of relating to God. It's a new, uh, new, new relationship and a new way of, of having that relationship. And it's through what Jesus did. Um, and it's a... It's, it's a, a new law that brings freedom. We look through the whole Old Testament, and yes, there was a fervency. There was a desire from the people to, to obey the law and to serve God through the law, but it was a sure sign of failure. Even though they, were, they had the desire to serve God and to, and to obey all the laws, they failed, 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 failed. They could just never reach the standard. And so last week, I wanted us to see that Christianity and the law just cannot mix. They're in contradiction to each other. 
And so where we felt in our, in our life, well, I feel a bit, uh, the, the whole message of grace is really stretching me. So what I'll do is I'll mix a little bit of the law and a little bit of grace together. You cannot. All right? They are in contradiction to one another. If you turn with me to 1 Timothy 1, verse 8. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers for murderers and blah, blah, blah. Who is the law for? Okay, we see here in Scripture, first of all, there's nothing wrong with the law. The law is good. But who is the law for? It's for the unbeliever, isn't it? The law is for the unbeliever. The law is not for us. The law is to silence everyone before the Lord. The law is there to, to proclaim all guilty this is the standard of God. This is what God desires. And we all stand guilty before the standard of God. We've all failed. Now if you turn to Romans 3, verse 19 and 20. It says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. So that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. So we see that God sets the standard. He sets his law into, in, in position and we all become conscious of sin and we realize that we need a savior. We realize that we have not reached the standard. Okay, and we cannot live up to the law. And so just like Adam and Eve were conscious of their nakedness, we all become conscious of sin and that, we, and that there's nothing that we, we can do to hide from God, to hide our unrighteousness before Him. The law exposes it, right? Um. And it exposes our addiction to sin. It exposes the, 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 um, the, the world's constant bondage to sin. And as Paul speaks about in Romans 7, he speaks about this wretched man syndrome that I've mentioned before. He's just so conscious of sin right there. And what has the law done? It says, don't covet. But what, what, what the law is doing is it's, it's, it's causing me to look at do not covet, do not covet. And what does it do? It causes all covetous desires to rise up on the inside of me. So as I look at it, it just exposes the sin and it causes it to rise up even more on the inside of me. As Paul says, who will rescue me? Who will rescue me? Jesus Christ. We're just, we're just going through a number of uh, passages of Scripture. Here. Galatians 3, 19 and verse 22. What then was the purpose of the law? The Scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner to sin, so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. If we're staying there in, in Galatians 3, verse 15 and, and um, to 17. Brothers, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as, as no one can set aside... Or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. 
I'll stop there. Now, to give an example of that in everyday life is, let's say, for instance, I buy a car and um, um, I, I negotiate with the, with the dealer that I'm going to pay 20,000 euros for the car. I go down, I get the car, we sign the contract, the car is mine, and I go home. Well, one day in the post, about um, 430 days later, I get a note saying, listen, there was a, a, a deficit of 2,000 um, euros on that car. You need to come back so that we can alter the, the contract. Right Now, that is absurd, isn't it? That is absurd. Nothing like that would be able to stand. You bought the car under the contract, and in no legal court will, that, will, will any alteration of that contract stand. And this is exactly what happened with Abraham. There was a covenant made with Abraham that your seed will inherit the promise, inherit the earth, right? Now, even though the law is introduced 430 years later, it does not cancel out the original contract that was made with Abraham and his seed. Okay? And we are that promise. And we are part of that promise. All right? The law does not disqualify us from that promise. There was an original contract made. And it was not made void when the law came in. Amen. Do you understand where I am? You got, you got me? Good. Still in Galatians 3. It says uh, from verse 23. Before, the, before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. Now just think of that. Think of that. The law, the law made us a prisoner, didn't it? it we, were, we were locked up under the law. And, um, you know, I, was, I used to, as, um, when, when I first started um, working, I worked in maximum prison um, in South Africa, Pretoria, as a prison warder. And I used to sit on death row with the prisoners. And um, there were men that were sitting there that were waiting to die. That, they were sitting in a hopeless place. The walls around them was a constant reminder that you were guilty. Guilty, guilty all the time. And they were locked in that place, destined to death, because in South Africa, it was still the death penalty. So they were destined to execution, and there they were sitting in a place. They couldn't get out of that place. They were surrounded by walls that were a constant reminder that you are guilty and you're going to die. And that's of the law. That's a picture of the law. It's a constant reminder that you are guilty you are guilty. You are guilty. And that's all the Lord did was just in your face show you, you are guilty. You have fallen short of God's standards. And it was, it's an equivalent of somebody sitting in maximum prison on death row. Just hopeless. Caroline spoke of hopelessness this morning until faith came. Faith rose up. And it broke that hopelessness. And there was just an example right here this morning of Caroline's testimony. And it says here that in, um, in Galatians 3.23. So that the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of law. We have been set free. We have been set free from the law. We need, to, we need to break free of just that held captive mentality. And that's what sin makes you feel like. Sin makes you feel like that you are a prisoner. And that's why Jesus has come to set us free from that mentality. He doesn't hold our sin against us. He doesn't hold it up against us. And, but why do we hold it up against one another?
And that's the picture we've got to see, is that there no, Jesus no longer holds your sin against you. You've been set free. That prison door has been opened, and you are free. He doesn't hold your sin against you. See, law does not encourage. It does not build up, does it? The law does not encourage. It does not hold up. I mean, take your own life. I mean, when you when you are constantly reminded about your guilt and your sin, do you feel encouraged? Do you feel excited about life? Do you feel, yeah, I can run this race with perseverance. I feel like I can run it and win the prize. No. It comes to discourage. It comes to break down. It's there to lead us to Christ. Now we are in Christ. We have come to Christ. He has paid the price for us. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law has been taken away. We no longer need the supervision of the law. I've now, I'm now in Christ. I have the righteousness of Christ. My sin is no longer held up against me. I'm free from this prison. Now, yes, I can run this race with perseverance. I can look to the prize. And I can be fervent and excited. You see, that's what we've got to start stripping away from our Christianity, stripping away from our life, our walk with the Lord, is start stripping away this condemnation that we are under because the Lord, the, Lord is, the Lord is wanting us to run this race. We are supposed to be the happiest people on earth. Amen. Amen. <laughs> it leads us to new life out of that death sentence. Um, I, I read an example of, um, of, of a guy who uses this illustration. Let's say, for instance, you, you're driving down the road and you're off to the mall. And um, you obey the law and you're sort of driving at the right speed limit and everything like this. And you're noticing that there's a police car driving behind you and his lights are flashing and you're getting a bit nervous and you're looking at, I'm, I'm still keeping to the, to the speed limit. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm indicating. I'm, and you get to the mall and you park your car. And, and as you park your car, the police officer comes up and you're thinking, oh my gosh, what's this about? And, um, and you, you let down your window and you look and he's got this gleaming smile on his face. And he comes to the window and he says, I just want to commend you. You are such a law-abiding citizen. You have been driving at the speed limit. I, I, you're just such a, a pleasure to the community. Um, you know, I, I want to. I want to. We're giving out these certificates to all those who are just so so law-abiding, so pleasing to the community. And you can cash this in at any vehicle inlet and get them a free oil change. And um, you know, and so you just. Wow. Now, have you ever heard that happen? Have you ever heard the policeman coming up to you to say, I just want to commend you on your driving? Hey? No. The law is only there to bring your attention to what you are doing wrong. The law is not there to encourage you in any way. It's just to pinpoint your faults. It's, yeah, it's, it puts, it's, it's a finger pointing at you. Is there a finger pointing at you? Are you pointing a finger at yourself? So we've got to do away with the pointing finger. Amen? We've got to do away with the pointing finger. You know, just think of your brothers and sisters and you know, it's so easy for us to, 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 to take uh, Scripture and, 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 and to condemn one another with it, isn't it? And twist God's Word and, um, and bring each other down. I mean, I, um, I contact, I, I had this dream the other night of somebody and, I, and um, oh, my heart was just so full of love for this person. And, 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 and I know in the past we've had issues and, um, and so I woke up after this dream sort of thinking it was about, 
2, 2.30 in the morning, and I was just, my heart was full of love, and I thought, I'm just going to text the person and just say, you know, I just woke up from a dream, and my heart's just full of love for you. Maybe we can get together for a coffee or something. So I thought, I, I did say, it's an odd hour for me to send you this text message, but I, I don't want to let the moment pass. So I did, and I text the, sent the text message. I didn't hear from the person for a few days. Um, and then I got an email saying, yeah, a lot has happened in the past, and we need to talk about it. If any friendship is going to be, there are things that we need to talk about, issues that have happened in the past. And I thought, hmm. So I wrote back and I said, actually, I just want to move forward. I just want to talk about the future and the good things that lie ahead and just to lay aside all that stuff and start again. You see, there's no point in just bringing up old stuff. We need to learn to forgive and forget. We need to learn that when Jesus forgives us, he forgets that we had ever sinned. Amen? It is gone. It is finished. And so when you reconcile with somebody, don't bring up the past. Don't say, but hold on, we need to sort out some stuff that has happened in the past first before we carry on. Okay, I mean, I understand. I mean, if you've got real, real issues, communication's good. But we need to learn to forget. We need to learn to understand how Jesus has taken our sin and he has cast it aside so far from us. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he has removed our transgressions from us. We need to learn to do the same with one another. And when, when God gives us that ministry of reconciliation is to understand as far as the east is from the west, that's how far he's removed our transgressions from us. Amen? So anyway, the law is there to, just to pinpoint and to show us our faults. Legalism. I mean, uh, legalism is, is, will never produce love. Amen. If, we, if you are caught up in legalism, you've got a real love issue. If you're bound by legalism, God needs to break through and show you His love. Amen. James 2 and verse 10 in effect is just basically saying, if you're keeping 1% or 99% of the law, it's one and the same thing. You are guilty of breaking the whole law. So where, whether you are just an outright scoundrel and you're only like keeping 1% of the law, or you are just right up there keeping 99% of the law, you've failed the whole law. You've broken the whole law. So again, as a Jesus and the law, you can't mix the two. You can't mix grace and the law together. It's either the whole law or it's all of grace. But it cannot be 50% law, 50% grace because you've broken the whole law. Okay? We cannot mix the two. We've got to die to the law. And that's just something that I'm just wanting God to do in my life, wanting God to do in each one of our lives, is to just set us free from, from that ministry that brings condemnation and bring us into that ministry of life and life in abundance, freedom. Bring us into the place of freedom, understanding His love. And, and, and to, start change, to start to change our focus. Because in Galatians 5, while we're still in Galatians here, Galatians 5, 2 and 3, um, it says, where's Galatians 5? Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised. Okay, so let's say, for instance, there's just a, you're keeping the whole law, but you're letting yourselves be circumcised. Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised, if you allow just one little bit or one part of the law in your life, that, that, you, that he is obligated to obey the whole law. 
So if you want one little bit of the law in your life, you are obligated to obey the whole law. Okay? And if that's what you want, you are trying to be justified by law. You have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Again, we've got to just change our focus. We've got to change what we're looking at. It was something that uh, uh, Craig Hill brought up in, in the Ancient Paths. Is, um, he brought a very good illustration. Is if, I, if I want to take a photograph of you guys and I'm focusing my camera here, I'll never get a picture of you guys Okay, if I'm focusing here. I will never manage to live a life of freedom if I'm focusing on sin, if I'm focusing on the law. I will never live a life of the freedom of the spirit that the Lord has intended for me. We've got to change where we're looking. See, law continues to excite sin on the inside. Paul speaks about that covetousness that rises up. It excites sin. So if I'm living under the law, I'm going to always be in bondage to the law, to, to sin. And when the flesh tries at its effort to overcome sin, sin will win all the time. Our perspective is everything in our battle against sin. Take your perspective off sin and put your perspective on that which Jesus has done for you. Remember, we've been speaking uh, over the last. Uh, a few weeks ago, we were speaking about 1 John 3 and verse 9, about the seed that remains on the inside of it. In, in, in ancient past, we looked at that yesterday. There is a seed that remains on the inside of us. Okay, The Lord, when he, when he has lavished His love on us, that we shall be called sons and daughters of God. And He has put a seed on the inside of us. It's a seed that remains. It's a seed that will never be taken from us. In 1 John 1 23, it says, born again of an incorruptible seed. It's a seed that cannot be corrupted. You are pure, you are holy, you are righteous. No matter what you do, you cannot corrupt what is on the inside of you, who you really are, your true nature, your true identity is that you are pure, you are righteous, you are holy. There is nothing you can do that can corrupt who you really are. Amen? Amen. You are without sin. You are holy. Amen? You are holy. You can call yourself Ayos. Ayos. I'm Ayos Grigoris. (laughs) Okay? (laughs) I'll be shot down in Cyprus for saying that. (laughs) But there is an Ayos Grigoris, isn't there? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because we, we have been changed. We, have, we are new creations in Christ Jesus. We have a seed that is incorruptible, that is on the inside of us. Nothing can corrupt that. Nothing you can do can corrupt your new nature, the new, the new you. All right? Ayos. Ayos. Okay. <laughs> Go look at yourself in the mirror. Say your name, Ayos so-and-so. Say it now. Okay. Did you get that? Ayos Grigoris. We can have little icons made of us. No, 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 no. (laughs) Christ in you, the hope of of glory, okay, and and Craig Hill brings that illustration of um, of you know a seed can only produce after its own kind, okay. You cannot you, you cannot plant an apple seed and expect to get pears, all right. It's going to produce apples, and if the seed of Christ is on the inside of you, that incorruptible seed, what is it going to produce? The nature of Christ. The very fruit of the Spirit is inevitable in your life. All right? It is, it is a definite, it is a guarantee because of who you are. Because of your nature, the guarantee is that you will produce love, joy, peace, 
patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. That is your nature. And that is the fruit that is going to come from your life. Because that's who you are. Do you see? We must change our focus. Amen? Because I no longer want to be bound by producing the, the fruit of what I'm focusing on. Amen? It says we've got to keep in step with the Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit. Keep walking in the Spirit. Keep flowing in the Spirit. Keep strengthening the things of the Spirit. Keep your focus on that which the Spirit is leading you into. And you know what? You know what I want to challenge us to do? You know, out of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, only one gift is there to edify and build you up. And that's the gift of tongues. Now, how many of us have neglected that gift? How many of us have just got tired of using that gift? I want to challenge you. Start stirring up the gift of tongues. Start stirring up the gift of tongues. It's the only gift that is given to the church to build you up. In Jude 1 and verse 20, Philip, if you, Jude 1 and verse 20, if you can throw that up. It says, build yourself up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Build yourself up in your most holy faith and pray in the Spirit. I believe that's part of keeping in step with the Spirit. I believe that's part of exercising where your focus needs to be. So I want to challenge you. You know, don't despise the things of God. Don't despise tongues. I want to challenge you to stir it up again. It's just something that God has been challenging me to do. It's just to be praying in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit. And, I, and, um, and I've been doing it, and, and you know, it has changed my focus. It has really changed my focus. And so I, I think it's just so practical. This morning in, um, in the, in the um, pre-service prayer meeting, the Lord just gave me Colossians 2. Um, this wasn't part of my sermon, but I want, to, I want to just encourage us with it. Colossians, no, it's not 2. Colossians 1. Speaking about Jesus... In, from verse 15, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through His blood shed on the cross." We, let's start focusing on this stuff. Let's start focusing on who we are. Who's on the inside of us? Christ in us, the hope of glory. And what does this scripture say? God was pleased to have all the fullness of God dwell on the inside of Jesus. Jesus dwells on the inside of us, the fullness of God. And He holds all things together. Right? And he, he, he reconciles all things to himself. Do you know when Scripture says that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation, that means that nothing, nothing is impossible to reconcile to God. No heart, no person is hard enough to be reconciled to God. 
Amen. That's where we've got to start putting our faith. Is the, the seed that is on the inside of us, the power that is on the inside of us. Start to exercise that. Start to get excited about that which is on the inside of us. Who we really are. That we've been given authority over all things. That we can start speaking into people's lives. We can start speaking into circumstances. Start declaring the word of God. Start rising up to who we really are. Amen. Start bringing down strongholds. Start releasing prisoners. Start seeing people reconciled to Jesus. Having that ministry and start getting excited about it. That's the gospel. That's getting excited about the gospel. Who we really are. Amen. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you will start changing our focus. I pray, Jesus, that you start to get us excited about who we are. Lord, I pray, let the revelation sink in and, Lord, let it start to break us free of being miserable and getting excited. Lord Jesus, that we start walking in the authority that we have. We start walking in our inheritance. Lord, we start focusing on that. Lord, and that our inheritance is this earth. We want to thank you, Lord, that nothing, nothing, nothing has cancelled the original contract that we are heirs of this world. And that, Lord, we can ask you for the nations and you will give us the nations for our inheritance. We can ask you for this nation. We can ask you for Cyprus, Lord, that you can give it to us as our inheritance. Lord, as we are praying this morning, we can look to the north and we can look to the south and we can say, be reconciled in Jesus' name. Be reconciled to Jesus. We can look at households. We can look at marriages. We can look at people's lives and say, be reconciled to Jesus. Because we have the ministry of reconciliation. That Lord, that we are a force and a power in this land that cannot be contended with. Father, I pray, release your people. Release your people into this nation. Release your church, Lord, into the places that you want us to be in. Release us into the lives of people. Release, Lord, your people. Release the hope of glory. Release glory. Release answers. Release healing, Lord, in Jesus' name. Because you've given us the keys of the kingdom to release your kingdom here on earth. What we bind on earth shall be bound. What is bound in heaven shall be bound on earth. What is loosed in heaven will be loosed here on earth. Lord, we want to say, let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come in Jesus' name. Lord, here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we want to see captives set free. We want to see those prison doors open. We want to walk in our inheritance, Jesus. And we know that you are waiting and the earth is waiting and the earth is groaning. Lord, as one who is in childbirth for the sons of God and the daughters of God to be revealed. So Father, I pray, open our eyes. Lord, let the revelation change us. In Jesus' name, amen.